Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. In a day and age where a recent study indicated that 80% of pastors would leave the pastorate this day if they had an equivalent salary in another setting, we are in a day where leadership has increased in difficulty almost to a point of it being unimaginable. Uh, Leadership is always difficult always. But we have to say that in a rage-filled, polarized, highly contemptuous day where the other side, whatever side that might be, needs to be excoriated, if not expunged from existence, leaders are attempting to manage, to grow, and indeed resolve levels of conflict um, that exceed again. Uh, anything that I've seen in in my number of decades on this earth. So we want to open up the discussion, what it means to lead well. But we're going to begin with this category, healing to lead. Not a first, we're going to address healing in a second conversation. But we want to first open the door to what's the reality of leading? and stating very clearly, every person's a leader in some form. Every person is influencing others to some degree, but particularly those who are in more formal leadership positions, whether you're a pastor or whether you're managing your children's soccer team, you are in the middle of something complex and difficult. And I have the pleasure, of course, to be with Rachel Clinton Chen, who is back in the saddle. Rachel, I'm going to put you in the spot of introducing our beloved. Sure. Well, thankfully, this is someone you've heard from many times on the podcast. This, uh, we are thrilled to be joined by Linda Royster, um, who has many titles, but she is the uh, manager of strategic alliances for the Allender Center, but also a core part of our instructional staff and team, our leadership team. <laughs> um, she's also a therapist, among many other things, because we're not just defined by our work. But that's, you know, I want to just make sure people know some, some of the many hats you wear, Linda, in our world. Well, thank you for that sweet introduction. It's wonderful to rejoin the podcast and be in conversation with the two of you. So thank you for the invitation. Linda, I would only add that you wear so many different hats at so many different points that it's almost like you're a haberdashery uh, of of hats. So uh, all to say, I'd love for the two of you to begin by responding to what would be a a somewhat, I don't know, I I think many people would assume to be a rather depressing beginning. I do think it is a very challenging, I mean, I think leadership in general is very challenging and I'm always baffled when people say they want to be leaders um, because I do think most, <laughs> most of us have like really tried hard not to be. I mean, I can't tell you how many times even recently I've been like, you know, whatever parts of me tend to find myself calling people to something or, you know, whatever. I, I, you know, when I came to Marisol Graduate School, now the Seattle School, I said, I'm going to be a wallflower. You know, like, I'm going to just be quiet in the classrooms. I'm, I'm reinventing myself. I'm, you know, I'm going to find a way. So I, I do think in general, leadership has very many challenges, which we'll get into. I do think this is a very complex time. People are traumatized. There is, there are many reasons to be traumatized. As we've said, this is a very apocalyptic time in our world. And what I mean by that is, I mean, yes, if you want to go, like, I do think it is, you know, who knows, who knows where we are in the, in the eras of 
a biblical understanding of history. But I do think apocalyptic just means revelatory, unveiling, un- unveiling, um, and bringing above ground what has maybe been underground, but felt and known by many, if not seen by all. And so it's not like we're in like a new time, but the complexities and the ways they've come above ground and the way people have been licensed to indulge, um, in protective defenses, uh, is a very challenging time to lead well. I think there are a lot of people leading at this time. I don't know how many people are leading well. And as you mentioned, Dan, like the level of burnout when also everything's changed. I mean, um, when you look at even what the pandemic, we're still we're still in a pandemic, even though I know we don't like to talk about that. Um, and we're still feeling the ramifications of of so much of the world changing. So, you know, I had said jokingly before we started, like, why, why would anyone lead? And this is where I'm going to turn it over to Linda, because she had a very encouraging (laughs) word. And I felt like I, well, I really needed to hear that. Thank you for reminding me why we do this work, why we're even having this conversation. Oh, yeah, I I can identify with what you began by naming as uh, kind of the concern or maybe even the fear or hesitancy around leadership and leading. And I often have thought of myself as being a reluctant leader Um, uh, and really often just saying yes when I have run out of excuses. Um, And when the no kind of feels more like I am I am not being obedient to what I sense the spirit leading me to. Um, but, but I've often put up the, the protest and um, will continue to say no, 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 until I cannot in good conscience say no anymore. Um, and so leadership is very difficult. Um, and my sense to what you were you were naming earlier about what we're going through collectively is this sense I what came to mind was uh, containment and uncontainment. Like we're people collectively who feel so uncontained, yeah. and we long for a kind of containment that can help us settle, feel like we have some direction, feel like there's someone that's bigger, stronger, wiser, kinder. As I heard a professor say that can help us, our bodies, our hearts settle. And when we are uncontained, we Mm. frail. We frail when we feel like we don't have a boundary or we don't have leadership that can help us feel settled and well, well well-contained. Like there is some security or parameter around us. Then I think, and I think we move more toward Mm. madness when we can't feel the goodness of the boundary of what good leadership can provide. But the picture for me that I have returned to many times uh, as a result of uh, feeling cast, thrown into leadership, uh, I, I feel that the most appropriate stance toward leadership, as you put it so well, Linda, is to be reluctant. Moses was reluctant, Exodus 3. Uh, and God didn't give a whole lot of ground for, should we say, a, a highly attuned uh, response. Uh, essentially, it's the fire is burning before you and I'm sending you. But I'll send you with your brother. Uh, I'll send you with Aaron. So there is some degree, even there, of um, comfort. Uh, but I go to Numbers 11 through 16. 11, chapter 11 through 16 is a rich uh, and complex picture of, of what it means, I think, to be a leader. I'm just going to read a small section. This is in verse 10 of chapter 11. And that is, Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their tents. Talk about trauma. I mean, every single tent of millions of people are wailing. And just, I mean, just to think about how even one child crying, uh, this is a sad piece of data, but um, uh, regimes that torture people, 
do one of two things. They put you in a room with total silence because silence is literally deafening and deadening. Or the second greatest sound that disrupts the human condition uh, is people wailing. So it 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 enervates, it, it disturbs our, our whole mere neurons when there is that level of grief. And this is all over. We're tired of manna. We're tired of manna. We want meat. And this is Moses's response. He says, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you would put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? I mean, it's uh, we, we often have spoken about lament psalms, complaint mm -hmm. psalms. This is not quite in a poetic structure, but it certainly is the kind of biting, cynical, angry, overwhelmed, fragmented stance in the face of what the people of God uh, are literally mourning and mm -hmm. crying over. You know, did, did I conceive them? Why am I having to carry them? You know, am I their nurse? And why have you put this burden on me? So that reality of what anyone who leads will eventually come to is, I cannot bear the suffering that I cannot resolve. Mm -hmm. And I cannot bear the burden of indeed changing the world, the situation, the complexities of what we're in. So between that inner world, I can't bear it, and the outer world, I, I cannot carry you. Uh, I think that's certainly a significant war for most leaders, that internal, external war. Yeah, I hear it, in Moses' complaint, I hear so much of a mothering language so much of the mothering language to nurture, to soothe, to comfort. And he's this protest is asking, can he provide that kind of nurture, that kind of care and containment back to that word again. Mm -hmm. and, and the connector for me uh, is just the sense of, of we we're leading in a sense to serve and that service is mm -hmm. to provide care. That service is to meet some of that deep longing, some of the cry, cries of the heart, um, to pro provide a kind of relief, a kind of comfort um, that the people are longing for and maybe can't name, but are longing for a cry that might, but that might be nameless, but a cry nonetheless. And I'm wondering, Rachel, what it's like for you to not be able to bring oh. comfort to your precious little I mean, one. I actually felt agony when you were reading this because it's like I have one, well, three, I have three humans, three tiny humans, one who's like almost is taller than me now. So they're not so tiny anymore, but one very tiny human. And I think you're right, Linda, that mothering language and even the like, did I did I conceive these people? Like, like it is so, it is such a like, uh, cause just one tiny human needing something from me that I can't, a need that I can't meet it. it I actually have to go back to therapy and maybe do some EMDR around because it sends me into panic. Like the way my biochemicals rise in longing and desiring because I do f have a deep love for her and wanting to like be able to bring soothing and containment. And when I, we hit those moments together where, you know, for whatever reason, I can't figure out exactly what she needs, or maybe she's just not going to be easily soothed for a minute. And so I'm like to hear, <laughs> to think of many, many people crying out in that way that stirs your heart. Um, to meet exactly what you both have named so well, you know, to meet the cry of the heart, to meet the needs, um, and yet not be able to, like, I genuinely right now, I'm like, 
okay, where's, I, I need some, I need some, I need to rock. <laughs> I need to go to my mindfulness practices that I have to do in the middle of the night as I'm sleep deprived. Um, and it does feel very, I, I know all three of us could say that feels very like palpable and tangible yeah. that, that crying out the longing and the desire and the terror of the places where scarcity, where agony meets um, what sometimes feels like impossibility. Hmm. Well, I, it, it's not etymologically connected, but I've often thought of the word crisis, crisis, as the context of those cries. And wherever there is that cry of just uh, demand, I, I'm sick of and I want, or um, whatever is going on in, in the hearts of the people that you serve, there is the creation of confusion. And we're not going to go through the whole passage, but if you do read it, you'll see Moses's confusion. And that often is a byproduct of crisis. But it, what also occurs is the creation of power struggles within the community. And that's another thing that's inevitable. Crises or trauma creates confusion, fragmentation. That's normally how we speak about it. But also the politicalization where you go to one person, you align against the leader, and you begin to see that this process is ancient. It's, mm. part, of, it's part of the fabric of every human being for thousands of years, that wherever a leader exists, there will be some degree of complicity with others to undermine, to politically overthrow, especially in the face of trauma. And the issue as it continues, chapter 12, uh, Aaron uh, and Miriam end up accusing uh, uh, Moses uh, of being married to a Cushite, uh, and he is, uh, and at least some uh, a, a interpreters would say, this is actually a racist move. Mm -hmm. um, the Kushites would probably be darker skinned. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's an assault, not on his marriage only, but a demeaning of, uh, of her heritage. And then uh, the accusation of, wait a minute, God doesn't speak just through you, Moses. He speaks through us as well. So now we've got comparison. We've got conflict. And uh, again, it, no wonder Moses and a lot of leaders want out. And if we can just start with the reality that it's inevitable. It's inevitable. If you're a leader, there will be moments of uprising, of rebellion, of people turning against you, of good friends, even your own kin turning against you, accusations being made. And in that frame, the desire to quit uh, is more than just real. Uh, it's a, in one sense, a very understandable trauma response of fight or flight, or in certain cases, freeze or fawn. But the fact is, what do we do with that implicit, I got to get out because you're going to kill me. Uh, I just love for the two of you to ponder, you know, the moments in your own lives, you don't have to go into particulars, but where something in you just said, hell, I'm out of here. Uh, and yet that question of what kept you? Mm. Yeah, that's such a big question. And, you know, so many memories. And that's that's what's in part unfortunate is that there are so many memories um, of being in positions of leadership. And I think all leaders wear a really big target on their backs, like that they become the the place where all kinds of projections and all kinds of unhealed wounds are directed and sent flying toward the leader uh, to capture all of the unhealed, all of the trauma, um, all, of the, all of the heartache. So the, the leader becomes uh, the bin or the basket where all of that gets placed um, and unjustly so, so, but it gets placed there. And it's such a, revel it's such a revelation of um, what happens when when harm goes unaddressed, what happens when there are 
those deep places that you feel really afraid to attend to and it just starts to show up and come out sideways in one sense. <laughs> so, so leaders wear really big targets on their backs and um, it is, in one sense, um, I, I don't think we can escape that um, because of the nature of, of who we are as human beings. It feels inescapable. Um, and, and when we can't escape the call to lead um, because there is hope that's, a, that's abiding, because there is hope for more, there is hope for goodness, there is a call and a burden for people to experience freedom and more, to experience shalom, if you will. Like it, it, that's in part what makes it bearable for me is remembering that there is more and sometimes moving forward with wounds and cuts and sometimes feels like a limb is about to fall off, but you move forward because hope abides mm. and comfort does come. Rachel? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm just laughing because I feel like I've been in this season where I've been like, let this cup pass from me. Like, I, I mean, Dan, I think we've even said this on the podcast. Linda, I know I've said it to you. Like, I just want to open a bakery. Like, I just want to like open a tea shop. And what makes me laugh about that? And I do think, you know, leadership is a paradox, right? Because I think how we talked about like in this verse of Moses, like it is a calling and it is servanthood. And you don't like name yourself a leader. And sometimes a position, even though the structure might give you a leadership position, like leadership is authorized because you actually have people following you or like <laughs> authorizing you, right? And so I've had many seasons where I have been like, screw this. I am done with organizational leadership or even like pastoral ministry leadership or whatever. And, and then I go to contexts that I, in my head, do not, I do not perceive to be, have any kind of leadership. I'm, I'm a teary stat, a tea shop, and I'm just doing my thing. And before I know it, I am functioning as a healer, pastor, hope bringer in the space, betraying myself because I can't help it. It's like coming to the Seattle school and talking, I think in the first class, because I was so compelled to join the conversation that I couldn't not do it. And so I think you're right, Linda and Dan, that sense of like, if you can't get, like shake the calling, if you can't, if there's a fire shut up in your bones, if this desire to participate in the bringing of shalom and the co-creating with God and the spirit and community. And I think that that's what keeps me staying is that I don't want to play alone. I don't want to do this work of the kingdom alone. I want, ultimately, I want to join others in doing that, which I'm at odds with right now, because I feel like I, I've also known a lot of loss there. You know, people leave people, like you said, people get mad in any context I've been in. Every church I've been a part of has had some massive split and, or like half the people leave or, you know, it's just, there is this sense of like, ah, our humanity, <laughs> like because that's the thing, right? Like, it's not only if you can't escape the calling, but you also can't escape being human. And it's going to happen in your family. It's going to happen in the places you find yourself. And so I do think in some ways, I can relate to Moses's sense of like, God, why have you burdened your servant? So <laughs> like, I'm just wanting to be helpful. And um, and, and, and so much has been given to me, um, so much and the desire to give that away or to see, to faithfully steward what I have been given. Even if I have fantasies of like, I'm never leaving my house again. I'm going to move to an Island. No one will know me. And maybe someday that will get to be my reality, but it's not this day. Not today. Well, and what you quoted a few moments ago uh, from Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7, I've been deceived and you deceived me. You overwhelmed me and prevailed against me. Yet when I try and shut you out, you are like a fire that burns within me. And that becomes the reality, <clears throat> I think, of, of what... What we want to begin to move a little bit toward 
And that's the question of what's the healing that needs to come in order for something of leadership to be played out? We need to come back to Linda's comment about containment. How, what needs to grow within us to create a kind of containment that's not control, but does hold this ground ultimately of ambivalence. You deceived me and prevailed against me, but yet when I try to shut you out, I cannot do so. That's at least, you know, for the prophet Jeremiah, is holding something of the complexity of living deep in the fallen world and yet as well, even more deeply knowing something uh, of the pulse uh, of desire and and indeed the need for comfort. So I think as we as we come to something uh, of an end, I think we, in our beginning, Linda, you were talking about passage in First Corinthians that I think is just crucial for us to have to be able to say, why would we want to stay in this? What's yes. what's what's the joy. <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we are able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want comfort, but perhaps as much, we want to be people who bring comfort. And mm -hmm. that mutuality, so clear in that passage, we are meant to receive and we are meant to give. And we can no more kill uh, the hunger to receive than I believe we can truly kill the hunger to be able to give. And that, uh, I think we would say, is the core of leadership. And yet we need healing. So we'll step soon uh, into that conversation. What's the healing that every good leader who's reluctant, who has the ability to uh, stand before God with lament, and yet with a clarity of, I uh, can't escape what I know I'm made for. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.